I did. This is my uh, centennial haircut. I'm expecting it to last another hundred years. Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't change that uh, jacket. That's a cool jacket, man. All right. It's one of the few surviving things I have from high school, and it's really <laughs> warm. And since I'm in my cold garage, I put it on. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it looks good on you, man. Thank you, sir. Mayor, this is Anthony from AGP Video. Our devices are rolling, and the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, good evening. This is the City of Morro Bay City Council. Uh, this is a regular meeting. It's Tuesday, January the 12th, 2021. It's 5.30 p.m. This meeting is being held via teleconference. Pursuant to Section 3 of Executive Order N29-20, issued by Governor Newsom on March 17, 2020, this meeting will be conducted telephonically through Zoom and broadcast live on cable channel 20 and streamed on the city website. Please be advised that, pursuant to the executive order and to ensure the health and safety of the public, by limiting human contact that could spread the COVID-19 virus, the Veterans Hall will not be open for this meeting or any meetings in the near future. Um, thank you, and Madam Clerk, could you please establish a quorum of council members? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Addis. Council Member Addis just joined the meeting. Yes, she's here. And Council Member Barton. I'm here. <laughs> Council Member Davis. I am present. Council Member Heller. Here. And Mayor Heading. Present. Thank you. We do have a quorum. Um, I will go ahead and call the meeting to order. And in the um, regard to the recent events that have occurred in our country, um, as well as the significant impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and an increase significantly in the, not only the number of cases, but deaths, not only in San Luis Obispo County, um, in the state of California and across the country. Um, I would like everyone in your own way to take a moment of silence, um, um, paying um, honor and um, laying out your uh, respects in your own way. And let's just take that moment right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I will ask our clerk to display the flag and um, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, States of, America, of America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, which it stands one nation, been, under God, God indivisible, visible, Liberty, Liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. Thank you for that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, uh, Chris Newmeyer, do we have a closed session report, sir, this evening? Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, and Happy New Year, Morro Bay. Uh, no closed session items to report. Thank you, Chris, very much. We appreciate that. Um, we'll move to mayor and council members' reports, announcements, and presentations. Um, council member Addis, would you like to lead us off? That would be great. Thank you, mayor. Um, and thank you, everybody who is joining tonight. I did want to open up with a serious topic. I was very alarmed uh, by the insurrection at the Capitol, which feels like it happened an incredibly long time ago now, but really it was just um, on January 6th. Six days ago, we had heard that five people died, another uh, person died, was announced, died today, that a second police officer uh, was murdered there. And in my lifetime, and I would say in the lifetimes of most people, 
present this evening, there's never been a worse attack on our democracy. And it's my personal belief that it's our job as elected officials to stand up for the people and to stand up for the system that allows all of us to be in office and to be representing the community tonight. I know that many people might think um, that the insurrection at the Capitol happened far away or that it really doesn't affect local government. But we have to remember that as representatives, we are here uh, because of free and fair elections that have a long history in our nation, both at the presidential level, but also at the very local level. And it's really up to each of us um, to participate in our democracy and to stand up for what's right. And this week we received a letter from Women's March San Luis Obispo. Um, and what it said is Women's March Slow organizers join calls for President Donald Trump's immediate removal from office either by invoking the 25th Amendment or by impeachment for inciting violence against the government of the United States, and that Donald Trump's bid to overturn the, result, the results of the free and fair election that he lost cannot be met with silence, that our democracy belongs to the people, that it is imperative that we hold those who violently attacked our capital and who promoted such attacks responsible and that we call on every local official to support this effort. And Women's March Slow went on to say, please join us by using your platform, your platform and speak out for the sake of our democracy. Um, so I am gonna use my own platform to speak out for this, but I also will be asking my colleagues at the end of this meeting, and I hope each of you will join me in speaking out. And uh, it's my hope that as a body, we can speak up for our democracy later when we get to future agenda items. Beyond that, I have one more, a couple more announcements uh, in this same vein, but I did wanna just pause for a moment so folks could take that in. Uh, beyond that, through Women's March San Luis Obispo, we do have three events coming up, all of them having to do with uh, powering up our democracy. On January 13th, tomorrow, we have Answering the Call, which is a Zoom event where um, local leaders are interviewed about how they're answering the call to support community action, mostly in the time of COVID. On January 16th, we have a happy hour. It's an interactive Zoom as we get ready for January 3rd, which is just three days after the inauguration, where we will have an event featuring Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, as well as a number of other state legislators, activists, and our resident poet, Diane Sousa, and all of that sound at womensmarchslow.com. But the reason I'm weaving these two together is that it's incredibly important for all of us to be thinking at this time about what we're doing uh, to participate in our democracy and what we're gonna be doing across the next days until the inauguration to make sure that we have a peaceful transfer of power and that we use our voices as elected officials um, and as citizens and residents to do the right thing. So thank you. Thank you for that, Council Member Addis. <clears throat> um, Council Member Davis, sir, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to recognize one of our special moral based citizens tonight, Ruth Schooler. Ruth has adopted Quintana Road between Main Street and the Roundabout, where she picks up trash along that section every day as well as anywhere else she finds debris as she walks around the city. She likes to say that she knows the location of every trash can in Morro Bay. Ruth also returns abandoned shopping carts to the stores where they belong. And she works as a volunteer at the Senior Center when it's open. So I wanna thank Ruth for helping to make Morro Bay a kinder and more lovely place to live we appreciate you very much. And that's all for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Davis. Um, always appreciate your recognitions of our wonderful community members. Council Member Heller, sir, please. Gotta get the video on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Uh, my announcement, I'd like to concur with council members uh, Addis's comments. Um, very disturbing what's happened in Washington. And even though I believe that all politics is local, certain things happen on national, international levels that I think requires local officials to speak. Uh, I sent uh, my letter a few days ago to elected officials at higher levels calling for the removal of the president of the United States. I would hope that this body would act and support a similar letter, whether it's the women's slow group or our own letter. I don't think it's too late to act. I think we can still act. I still think it's important that we go on record even though we're a little town here of 10,000 people. So wanted to support Don uh, in that. And uh, that that is my announcement. Thank you, Council Member Hiller. Very much appreciate that. Um, Council Member Barton, please. Oh, good evening. Um, I don't have any particular uh, things to report. So I'll, I'll uh, save my time for another another meeting. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, thank you, Council Member Addis, for um, for your report, uh, and uh, Council Member Heller for echoing that. I'm sorry, just. <clears throat> Um, and I assume, um, obviously, uh, we will wait to future until future agenda items. Pardon me uh, to have further commentary regarding that. So thank you. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, and uh, things uh, community members have gotten extremely um, uh, difficult, intense. The numbers across the country, but also primarily in the state of California. And now within our own county are skyrocketing. Um, you can go to readyslow.org and look at the details of it. I'm not going to read um, the extensive report that they do provide. Needless to say, um, yesterday we had a single day total of 500 new cases in San Luis Obispo County. Um, our death rate has increased significantly. Um, if there's good news in this, um, one piece of good news is that as a county, we do have uh, and maintain adequate ICU bed uh, capacity and hospital capacity. Although um, that is getting strained, we do have uh, 38 ICU beds available. Um, with only 15 currently being occupied uh, by COVID-19 patients. And um, that's good news for us, but for um, a majority of the, the Southern California region, um, uh, counties and, and hospitals, um, ICU bed capacity is um, at the level where there literally is no capacity and it is straining the system from a resource standpoint um, from the standpoint of the ability to care for patients. And a number of um, facilities are moving towards something that um, I have not seen in my 45-year-plus um, healthcare career, and that is <clears throat> having to triage patients and make decisions on who will be treated and who will not be treated um, in certain hospitals in Southern California because of the lack of resources. And, and this is a significant strain on our system. Um, I wanted to let you know that um, we have um, increased in the last month. Um, our average daily case rate has literally doubled. We are beginning to see the continuous impacts of the holiday with regard to holiday travel and holiday gatherings. Um, the case count in Morro Bay, specifically as a community, has gone up significantly, um, as you probably know. Um, again, fortunately, we do remain one of the lower percent communities with regard to COVID-19, but um, things um, are beginning to deteriorate rapidly. I, I wanted to point out um, issues with regard to uh, vaccinations because I think this is the uh, bright spot 
in the system. And I wanted to give you um, an update on the availability of vaccinations and more specifically what will be occurring in our county uh, with regard to the vaccination schedule. I've been getting many calls from constituents about the availability of vaccines. When will um, vaccines generally be available to my group, my age group, my healthcare status group, etc. cetera? Um, again, you can find detailed information on readyslow.org, but um, from a standpoint, I thought I would take a moment to let you know um, not only what our own county will be doing, but where we are headed with the vaccine. The vaccines, as you know, um, are highly effective, 94.5 um, to 95 percent. The two companies that have been approved, Moderna and Pfizer, require two doses in order to obtain that level of immunity. Um, they also appear to be effective so far against the mutant strains that are beginning to appear in California and across the country. That is good news. However, some of the treatment uh, medications that are being used to treat active COVID cases are showing resistance to um, certain treatments that are used to help slow the virus once one has already um, acquired the virus itself. That is of significant concern, obviously. Right now, um, we are involved in administering vaccines to um, San Luis Obispo County Phase 1A. Again, there's an extensive list on the website that you can find. Uh, however, basically, that involves healthcare practitioners, um, individuals like EMTs and paramedics that are on the front line. Um, skilled nursing facility, assisted living facility, residents and staff, um, physicians offices, um, chiropractic, uh, ancillary health offices, pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, community pharmacy personnel, um, et cetera. In San Luis Obispo County, um, they are administering at present about 500 vaccines per day. Um, at a single clinic at the public health department. Um, this again is reserved for the phase 1A group, which includes a majority of those individuals or individual professional groups that I outlined. Um, the next phase will include individuals 75 years or older or individuals with significant comorbid or secondary health conditions. Um, that phase is estimated to begin uh, with regard to the administration of the vaccine in our county, um, hopefully um, late January or early February. With regard to the general population, um, the availability of the vaccine for administration to groups that are not high risk, such that um, I would consider it to be something like getting the flu vaccine uh, will probably not occur um, because of um, the unavailability of resources to administer and the unavailability of significant um, amounts of vaccine at the local level. Uh, will probably not occur until the March to June time period. That's the estimate as of today. The county is moving to open up uh, three pods. Um, these pods will be um, similar to the existing uh, pod that is being um, administered by the health department um, at the health department. Um, it's very efficient, very effective. And as I said, they are doing about 500 vaccines a day. Um, the issue primarily is the unavailability of enough vaccinators or inoculators. Um, the county is attempting to um, increase the volunteer capacity um, of individuals that would be licensed and able to administer vaccines. In addition to that, um, the county is working with communities, and I consider to be Morro Bay to be one of the lead communities in this, and that is um, um, our, our chief, Fire Chief Knuckles, has put together a program uh, whereby 
Um, if you recall, two weeks ago, we had a flu vaccination clinic, which was really a, a test clinic for COVID-19 administration that hopefully will allow us to engage a number of community volunteers that are licensed to inoculate or administer vaccines um, that could provide a clinic locally that would be organized similar to what the county is, is doing. I'm very proud of our uh, fire chief and the leadership role he has taken in the community. And, and I can't say enough about what I consider to be the importance of taking this significant public health issue um, down to the local level and being prepared locally with resources and the availability to do, quote unquote, our own thing. Um, that will help us deliver a majority of vaccines, hopefully to community members that desire them. Um, the vaccines have proven to be quite safe with minimal side effects and or uh, problems. The vaccines, again, are extremely effective. Um, uh, one of the most effective vaccines um, of any vaccine we've ever had. And also, um, in order to get what is considered to be herd immunity, um, the general population needs to be vaccinated to the tune of about 70% in order to achieve that. And so one of the important things as a community that we will need to do is to get information out to our public, our community members, not only on the availability of these clinics and proactively trying to get our resource levels to a point where they will be adequate for us to administer our own in the community, but also um, get information out about the safety um, of these vaccines and the need for um, all community members to uh, achieve or get the vaccine. Um, I know this is a rather a lengthy uh, report, and I apologize for that. We are um, in the middle of um, the worst healthcare crisis that I have ever seen in my career. Um, and we, uh, unfortunately, uh, will continue to see, in my opinion, increases in the number of cases if we do not um, achieve herd immunity through through vaccines. Secondarily, I want to thank um, our community for um, um, adhering to the guidelines that have been set down by the state of California, the Department of Public Health, the CDC, as well as the San Luis Obispo County of Public Health. Um, as you know, we are still under the shelter at home mandate. And I will tell you, I've been asked by a number of people um, what's the main mode of transmission in Morro Bay? How are people acquiring COVID-19? What is it that we need to do to protect ourselves against, against this public health nightmare? I will tell you that the information is no different than it was um, several months ago. Um, gatherings of uh, non-immediate family members uh, that um, do not adhere to social distancing, that do not limit themselves to just two families, and do not limit themselves to appropriate mask wearing and frequent hand washing are the main issue or reasons COVID-19 is spreading. That is the gathering, especially in enclosed places of individuals who are not members of the same household and do it not adhere to strict standards of social distancing, mask wearing, frequent hand washing, et cetera. I implore you as a community, even though we are de dealing with difficult times, um, difficult mental health issues due to the restrictions placed upon us, limited socialization, limited ability to get out, um, difficulty with regard to maintaining um, a financial integrity of our homes due to loss of income, um, a loss of jobs, um, a loss of just sustenance in general, and the very suffering of our businesses in the community has been tremendous. Um, but this is not the time to do anything other than to be strictly adherent and accountable to the guidelines that have been laid down 
to pay attention to the information that will be communicated to you on a routine basis, and to please consider getting the vaccine when it becomes available to your community. Um, I know this council and your city staff is absolutely um, sold out to making this happen for Morro Bay. This is our number one public health issue. Our desire is to protect you, to usher you back to health, and, and to enable you to uh, receive all of the resources that you possibly can. I wanna thank the Chamber for working with our businesses who have suffered greatly. Please shop locally according to guidelines established by the county and state. Please support your restaurants through takeout only um, ordering. Please support our small businesses and our businesses in the community um, to assist them in, in maintaining um, viability or a semblance of viability through this terrible pandemic. Um, so thank you for um, taking the time to listen to me. There'll be more communications. Again, readyslow.org has significant information. Uh, you can get everything that I've just said there on a daily basis, all the numbers you've ever wanted, all the information with regard to vaccination administration, and also um, testing, which continues to occur in Morro Bay according to the existing schedule that you can find on the website, which is three days per week and will continue probably indefinitely until the pandemic is over. So thank you. Um, socially distance yourself, wear masks at all times, do not gather in groups greater than um, one other um, family unit outside of your immediate family. Frequent hash, hand washing is, is imperative, and please adhere to the shelter at home order. Pay attention to the vaccine administration schedule that will be forthcoming. Uh, thank you for that. Again, my apologies for the lengthy uh, report, but I am uh, so concerned about our community and your health that I thought it imperative to do that. Um, with that, I will turn it over to our city manager, Mr. Collins, please. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Happy New Year, everyone, and the, the audience and watching. Um, just wanted to uh, offer a few quick updates, uh, trailing off what the mayor just said. Uh, vaccinations are going to be a key, very key component to um, turning the tide on, on COVID-19, in addition to all the great work our community is doing to stay safe. Um, the cities in Slow County um, and fire agencies are working closely with the county to provide assistance um, in, in terms of actually administering shots. Only certain uh, types of job classifications can provide those at this time based on state and federal law or regulations. And so we are gonna do our best to provide uh, city staff and other cities are, are stepping up to the plate to do that to help accelerate uh, distribution of the vaccines. Um, there will be a discussion with city council because there uh, likely is a budget impact to that, um, but we wanted to make sure community was aware that we're all working together to move quickly on this opportunity. Um, the city has closed its uh, latest round of business, our small business grants for those impacted by COVID-19. Um, we've received, I believe, over $250,000 in requests for $50,000 that we have available. Uh, we're taking it to a committee for review probably next week and hopefully have decisions by uh, towards the end of this month of January. And I believe um, our community development director, Scott Graham, has a quick announcement as well. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Collins. Um, and happy New Year to everyone. Um, I have an announcement related to our upcoming planning commission meeting on the 19th. Um, the county will be presenting um, uh, project design um, for the Morro Bay to Cayucas connector trail. Um, so that would be a one mile trail that, that between um, Morro Bay and Cayucas that'll extend from uh, Toro Lane um, to Studio Drive, uh, parallel to Highway 1. Um, the planning commission will be reviewing that on the, receiving that presentation from county staff on the 19th um, at six o'clock. We don't have any other items on the agenda. Um, so that if you tune in, you'll get to see that and there won't be anything else in front of it. So you don't have to wait. Um, the intent from the county is to receive public comments on the uh, on the proposal. 
Um, there's no action taken by the Planning Commission. It's simply a presentation and an opportunity um, for our community to provide input um, on the trail design. So um, please tune in uh, next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Anything else, sir? Thank you, Mr. Grant. No, sir, thank you. Um, and uh, we can happy to answer any questions if you have any about the vaccination plan, but I think you covered it really well. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much for that. Appreciate that. Um, with that, um, I will move to general public comment. This is for um, items either on the agenda that you would like to comment about and or anything that uh, you would like to speak to with regard to our city. Um, if you're not able to stay for the meeting and would like to, again, comment on items on the agenda, now's the time to do that. The information uh, with regard to how to access public comment is now on our screen. Uh, you'll have three minutes, and I'm happy to um, open up a general public comment. Anthony, do we have anybody in the queue, sir? Uh, yes, Mayor. I have three raised hands in the queue. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Michael Martz. Michael, you are unmuted and free to give your testimony, please. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Uh, honorable Mayor and City Council members, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, again, my name is Michael Martz, and my family is the owner of a 45-acre property that wraps around the Casa de Flores assisted living facility. And along with the owner of the adjacent five acre undeveloped uh, seashell estates parcel, we submitted a letter to you recently uh, detailing our request for the city to include our two properties in the new general plan uh, LCP document to be rezoned from its current zone of suburban residential to RM slash PD. If these properties remain as currently zoned suburban residential, the housing product will be large lot, single family estate homes. And actually larger expensive estate housing is currently in great demand due to the pandemic as people in crowded cities are fleeing to the central coast. It is my opinion that Morro Bay does not need more large expensive homes. Uh, in addition, the current type of zoning is not favorable to the inclusionary development of more affordable mixed housing types. Uh, and it would result in the city's failure to address the many goals identified in the city's recent housing element. I realize that this request is coming to you at a late hour, uh, but fortunately, the there is still ample time for the city to take advantage of this window of opportunity to ensure that these sites general plan designation reflects the type of housing growth that the city needs and that the city that, that the citizens of Morro Bay would like to see moving forward into the next decade. Uh, in closing, it is our hope that you see this opportunity for the city's largest vacant parcel zoned residential to be developed in a way that is progressive and careful and that you will direct the city staff to evaluate these two properties together for inclusion in the pending general plan LCP document. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Michael. Um, Anthony, your next public comment, please. Uh, yes, Mayor. The next speaker is Chris, uh, forgive me for last name, but Rudabush. Uh, I think I got it right. And you're go ahead and unmuted and free to give your testimony, please. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Greetings and Happy New Year from the We Are the Care Initiative. My name is Chris Rodebush. As we begin 2021, we are starting a new chapter for the initiative and are looking forward to reinvigoration of our work. This new stage has been inspired by the tenacity of our child care professionals and the child care field in our community in the face of COVID-19. The pandemic has affected child care centers and family child care homes detrimentally, but our child care professionals continue to persevere and put the children and families of Slow County first. 
13% of licensed programs are currently inactive or providing distance learning only due to COVID. A recent survey found programs are operating at 76% of licensed capacity as a result of group size limitations and under attendance. Programs in our community have been forced to drastically adjust their day-to-day -day operations, utilize funds from razor-thin budgets to purchase more cleaning products and introduce even more stringent sanitation guidelines, all while staff are putting themselves and their families at risk each day. These programs are also a large part of our small business community, but they are often not recognized in the same light as our other small retailers, restaurants, or other local small businesses. Child care is absolutely an essential service and is in need of our support. And We Are The Care is excited to announce multiple opportunities for you to get involved and help. First, a child care supply drive is currently running through January 27th at all Sesslock branch locations. Please consider contributing gloves, disinfectant wipes, no contact thermometers, cloth masks, hand sanitizers, etc., to directly support local child care providers. Second, the We Are the Care will be hosting a virtual 2021 New Year kickoff event on Thursday, January 21st from 6 to 7 p.m. Join us for an overview of the initiative and its four task forces, a celebration of our many We Are The Care wins from the past 20 months, and an update on the first phase of the countywide child care study. We value our community and hope to utilize as the many strengths of its members from every background. Thank you so much for your time. As always, we will, we will be back soon with more updates. If you want to join us on January 21st to get involved with We Are The Care, please contact First Five San Luis Obispo County or find more information on our website, www.first5slo.org. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Anthony, uh, next public comment, please. Uh, yes, Mayor. Erica Crawford is the next one in line here with her hand raised. Welcome, Erica. Thanks so much. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the platform to communicate with you and with community members and business owners tuning in. And Mayor Heading and City Manager Collins, thank you for your comprehensive update on the COVID-19 vaccine rollout that you provided this evening. With the severe increase in COVID transmission over the last month that is continuing to worsen and with no date certain on when our economy will be able to meaningfully or fully reopen, we are recommending that businesses take immediate steps to secure federal and state economic assistance. The Payroll Protection Program, or PPP, which is a program through the SBA and Department of the Treasury, but that is accessed through participating banks and other third-party qualified financial institutions, has been reopened this week both for first-time applicants and for second draws. Businesses should navigate to the SBA's website, which is sba.gov, and or contact their bookkeepers, their CPAs, and bank branch specialists at participating banks to apply. The California Small Business Grant Round 1 is set to close tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. Businesses should go to careliefgrant.com right away to submit applications. Again, that program's first round is set to close tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. For information about other SBA programs like the IDLE and Express Bridge Loans, businesses should go to the SBA website or contact the Cal Poly SBDC for direct assistance. That's sbdc.calpoly.edu. Nonprofits are also businesses and are also experiencing economic hardship at this time. The PPP is an option for some nonprofits and the Community Foundation of San Luis Obispo does have multiple grant op programs that may assist our local nonprofit community. Most of these grants are due by this Friday, January the 15th. Their website is cfsloco.com. That's communityfoundationsloco.com. As ever, the Chamber is here to support anyone who needs information about these and other programs. We can be reached by phone at 772-4467 or are most responsive via email at this time at info at morrowchamber.org. And finally, for those who can, uh, thank you for the shout out to Shop Local. Please do support your local businesses. And if you can't support them financially at this time, a simple thing like writing a positive review or a social media platform, um, thumbs up or a follow for them means quite a lot. Uh, we will get through this together. Uh, I think we simply must. 
Thanks very much. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you, Erica. Happy New Year to you as well. Um, Anthony, next public comment, please. Uh, Mayor, I do not see... <laughs> I do not see any raised hands left in the queue. Bless you, um, Erica. <laughs> okay. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and close uh, general public comment. That will move us to... Uh, okay. There we go. That will move us to item A, our consent agenda. Um, let me go ahead and open up public comment for our consent agenda. This is public comment for items on the consent agenda only. And um, Anthony, any public comment, sir? Uh, Mayor Heading, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, with that, I will close uh, public comment for the consent agenda, bring it back to council, and either entertain a motion for approval and or if there are any items to pull, be happy to consider that. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd, I'd like to pull A5. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll just, uh, I have a motion to uh, approve consent agenda. Is there a second for that? Robert Davis seconds. Okay, but we have motion and a second with um, the pulling of, you said A5, was that Councilmember Heller? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilmember Addis, would you amend your uh, motion to exclude item A5? I will amend my motion to um, approve the consent agenda minus A5. Thank you for that. And uh, Councilmember Davis? Yes. Thank you. So we have a motion by Council Member Ennis to approve items um, all but A5. Um, and uh, second by Council Member Davis. Any further discussion on those? If not, we'll entertain a roll call vote, please. Thank you. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. Council Member Heller? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Council Member Heller, A5, sir. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Mayor. I have questions about AB 1600, and I don't know if uh, Katie can answer these or Scott Collins or Scott Graham, but I just thought it would go down the list because <clears throat> I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting source of revenue and what we can and cannot do with it. So I'm hoping to educate myself and the public at the same time. Great. Um, the public improvement projects, I'm curious, they are, does the state mandate what percentages we have to um, allocate, or is that something that we have control over, if you understand what I, what I, what I mean? Yeah, um, thank you for the opportunity to answer your questions, and I would like to invite either um, Mr. Leivick or Mr. Um, Graham or possibly the city attorney to add um, to the answers or um, navigate me through this um, question this um, question. So my understanding is is that um, the um, development impact fees are set by the council and they are not necessarily um, distributed to specific projects, um, but the projects have to be aligned with the particular development that paid the fees. And I'm happy for anybody of my colleagues that are more knowledgeable would like to add to that. I guess in a nutshell, development impact fees offset the um, impact of new development and must be at least somewhat related and um, to that new development. For example, if you increase um, traffic into an intersection and it needs, not that Mo Bay will need another traffic signal for quite some time, and you need a new traffic signal, those development, those traffic development impact fees would go to offset the costs of new development's impact in that intersection. And if I believe um, it's the development's fair share of that impact. Yes, yeah, so that needs to be roughly proportional to their um, impact. So that's a calculation that you would do for any project that comes forward? It's, it's 
Um, the calculation has been done through the impact fee study, and it's either based on a square footage of the project or the amount of traffic they generate. Um, typically for ease of implementation, it's based on um, um, a square footage. Um, for like um, water impact fees, it's based on a meter size, um, just to make the impl implementation um, simpler. Okay, and then there's some language in the staff report that says you've got to ensure that the funds are spent in a timely manner. So is that tied to the progress of the project or what does a timely manner mean in terms, in other words, I guess what I'm wondering about is can we accrue funds over say a five-year period for a larger project? Uh, yes, we can. And we can um, by programming funds to a project or encumbering those funds, we may be able to accrue funds over even longer period for a project that we're trying to um, deliver in the future. Okay, so that's something the council would decide during the budgeting process, I suppose, or? Yes, so we would recommend um, a funding source for a project that uh, may include uh, development impact fees in the um, budget calculation and those budget, those capital budget sheets. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you for taking a few minutes to explain that to me. I appreciate it. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Not a problem. Uh, thank you for uh, that clarification, and thank you, staff, for your response. Um, Councilmember Hiller, would you like to make a motion? Yes, I move we approve uh, A5 in the consent agenda. Second. I second. Motion by Councilmember Hiller to approve item A5. Second by Councilmember Davis. Any further discussion? If not, um, we'll do a roll call vote, please. Madam Clerk. I apologize. Um, Council Member Heller? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Addis? Yes. Member Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. And Carrie Spivo? Great, thank you for that. That moves us to our public hearing. This is item B1. This is introduction and first reading of ordinance number 642, reinstating and amending Morro Bay Municipal Code chapter 13.12 to update and expand the city's sewer use ordinance. Um, the public hearing process uh, will involve a staff presentation first uh, then we will go to council questions. I will then open up the public hearing and ask for public comment. After receipt of public comment, I will close the public hearing, bring it back to council for uh, deliberation and a motion. So with that, um, let me turn it over to uh, Mr. Leibick, it looks like. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm just gonna do a brief introduction. Um, this ordinance is really um, to protect the um, our future water supply. So the um, our water reclamation facility will be uh, generating um, highly purified water that will be injected into the ground for later extraction. We need to ensure that water is as clean as possible and that we don't have um, contaminants going into um, our wastewater system that don't belong there. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric Caceres and Lydia Holmes from Corolla Engineers and the program management team to give a brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, um, good to see everybody. Happy New Year. Um, Eric Caceres, the work program manager. Um, we are coming to you again on this topic. Uh, we had a presentation um, that was given um, by somebody from, uh, from our team back on November 17th, and we are now here to, uh, to give the first reading. And so we have an abbreviated presentation um, that is going to be given by uh, Lydia Holmes, who is our um, permitting lead for Corolla for, um, for the work project. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, so hold on, I'm just trying to figure out if I'm sharing. Am I sharing? You are. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can. All right. Okay, um, as Eric said, um, we're here to talk about the sewer use ordinance. 
And uh, of course, everyone is well aware that, that the city is investing in the new water reclamation facility. And we previously discussed the sewer use ordinance at the workshop in November. Um, Pre-treatment and source control are required to protect this new facility and all the in uses like Rob talked about, it's, it will be uh, producing a potable supply, but it also produces water that has to go out the outfall. Um, and um, the new facility of course needs to be run well. So you don't want to have anything in the sewer that can impact the, um, the treatment functions of the new facility. So the current municipal code does not provide adequate legal authority. So we have updated the sewer use ordinance to give the city that legal authority. And we also have an enforcement response plan, which establishes procedures for non-compliance with the pretreatment requirements. So major changes to the sewer use ordinance are that it authorizes the city to issue wastewater discharge permits to industrial users, general users, and food facilities. It provides monitoring, reporting, and compliance requirements for industrial users, establishes the city's enforcement policies, establishes discharge limits for industrial users, and incorporates the city's existing fats, oils, and grease or fog program. Uh, we have parameters that uh, in the sewer use ordinance that have discharge limits for industrial users. And there's a variety of reasons for the different um, constituents we have here, but it does um, represent protecting some of those different um, end uses that I talked about. So some of them are um, making sure that discharges to the wastewater treatment plant are within normal limits so that the wastewater treatment plant performs well. There are constituents like uh, salinity, uh, TDS, and sodium are good examples of that, which affect the uh, advanced treatment process performance. There are metals like copper and mercury that can be toxic and cause problems with your discharge to the ocean. So we need to make sure those stay within low levels. And then there's some constituents that we might be concerned about uh, if it passed through to your potable supply. So there are, um, there are different reasons for different discharge limits and why we put them into um, the sewer use ordinance. And then the enforcement response plan that I mentioned earlier, this is an administrative tool for the utilities department and the legal authority to implement it is in the new um, code chapter 1312. Uh, it summarizes top types of enforcement that are available to the city to respond to pretreatment violations, responsibilities and processes, provides guidance and a roadmap to the city for appropriate and consistent enforcement remedies and provides example forms and notices to carry out enforcement and inspection actions. We don't anticipate that the city is going to have to use this much, but you want to have it in place so that there are consistent measures um, and provide the city the authority if needed. So with that, uh, the next steps are that the ordinance reading number two and adoption of the new ordinance will be on January 26th. All provisions of the sewer use ordinance will be effective immediately after adoption. And then the city will start developing discharge permits for their industrial users and businesses. The industries are gonna be within the first year and um, select businesses will be permitted gradually over the following three years. And that's about 178 restaurants, and that's mainly focusing on that fats, oils, and grease um, provision that we talked about, and then 33 commercial businesses. And implementation will involve outreach to industries, businesses, and residences. All right, and that's all we have. Thank you, Ms. Holmes, I appreciate it. If you'll stand by, we're gonna to move to council questions. And with that, I will open it up for council questions. Um, if we could start with uh, Council Member Davis, sir, any questions? No, sir, I do not have any questions. Thank you. Council Member Heller, sir, any questions? I do have a few, thank you. you um, so apparently this program is required by the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Uh, 
for for any any project where they're injecting injecting uh, treated water into the ground and pulling it back out. Um, I think you estimated in the staff report the initial cost for the first year is two hundred sixty thousand or so, um, and then maybe hundred thousand dollars less following years. Can you tell? Could you? Two forty-five. I'm just gonna. Two forty-five. I'm yeah. sorry. Sure. Um, can you explain to me what what that fund is used for? What exactly will we be paying for and getting uh, for that money? Uh, so I would have to go back and pull that up, but it's the initial year is higher than the subsequent years because you're setting up the program and starting the permitting process and getting all the templates in order and. And um, there is sampling and monitoring, so there's staff time associated with that. Um, I'm trying to think what else is in that. Eric, I don't know if you remember, but it, and, and Joe, um, feel free to weigh in too. Yeah, I think that it's 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 split, um, and I'm pulling up the um, the exact split of the first year and subsequent years. Um, but it's higher in the first year because there's purchasing of, of sampling equipment. Um, and there's some additional staff time, as, as, as Lydia mentioned, for, um, for setting up the program. And then in subsequent years, um, the, the majority of the cost is related to staff time. Eric, your, your, um, your staff report is 245, 245,000 year one and 161,000 subsequent years, just FYI. Correct, thank you. And so that, that budget number includes the sampling that will be required? That's correct. Yeah, right. We made an F, we made an estimate of staff time, equipment, um, lab costs. We tried to make an estimate of everything that would be included. So that would include outreach, the sampling, any paperwork, filing, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so every every project like ours, every IPR project in California or maybe in the nation, I don't know, has to have this kind of a program, regardless of the size or the volume of water that is being treated, is that correct? So pre-treatment programs are required for any facility that is larger than 5MGD. And then the state also has um, required that potable reuse projects implement pre-treatment and source control programs. And so, yes, you're, you're correct. There's, so there's two different triggers. One would be if you're large enough, and then another would be if you're implementing portable reuse. And the, the thought process is that you want to make sure that you're protecting your, um, your treatment process so that you maintain high quality for all the different end uses. Okay, so this is uh, this is ongoing. As long as we do IPR work, we'll we'll be needing to have this program in place and implement it annually. Is that correct? Yes, there's there's going to be provisions that will carry through and require annual. That's what the 165 or whatever is 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 an annual cost. Okay, okay those are my questions. Thank you very much. Oops, thank you, Councilmember Hiller. I couldn't get my mic to come on. Sorry about that. Um, appreciate that. Uh, Councilmember um, Addis, questions? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilmember, um, let's see, do we get everybody else? Oh, Barton, Councilmember Barton, sorry. Um, I don't have any questions. I was just pleased to see the report and know that we are moving along smoothly you know, to get everything to come together for the completion of the um, of the plan. And so it was it was very um, uh, interesting and educational to to see all this and see the the back part of it, the many different sections that all go together. So I was pleased to see it. Great, thank you for that. A um, couple of questions for either Lydia or Eric. Um, with regard to the potential offset uh, through the collection of permit fees, do we have a sense of uh, what percent of the ongoing program costs might be um, offset by those uh, fees? We haven't started that discussion about what permit fees would be charged. And um, so I don't really have a good sense of that right now, sorry. 
Yeah, we, we haven't had we haven't had those detailed discussions about the actual the actual permit fee. This is going to be the cost for the implementation, um, and the, the permitting fee component hasn't been determined. Um, and do you have a sense of uh, potentially the number of businesses in Morro Bay that might be subject to the fee? Um, we have a couple of um, more significant industrial users that um, are um, we paid a particular attention to um, because of the type of, of, of discharge. Um, so there's two of those um, of those um, businesses that we have um, we've identified uh, and we've discussed, and then there's also uh, the restaurants are also um, ones that would be um, uh, that would be involved in this program. You're cutting out, Eric. Couldn't hear you. Oh, sorry. I was going to say there's two, um, two in particular um, that we're looking at for, um, let's say, uh, because of the salinity discharge or the saltiness of the discharge they have, uh, and then restaurants are also ones uh, that would potentially be um, uh, be covered under this. Okay, so um, for those significant, uh, maybe two businesses, do do we have a sense of? Um, the magnitude of the impact on their operations. And um, I know you've engaged with those businesses, but are we talking about, I mean, major hits to these these entities? Um, we're working closely um, with with one in particular um, that, that could potentially have the largest impact and uh, trying to figure out ways to um, uh, to make all the parties involved um, or to best suit all the parties involved in terms of um, being most protective of the treatment plant itself, uh, the collection system and the future potable water supply, um, but then obviously being um, uh, being conscientious to the business and not saddling them with, um, uh, with too many costs or requirements. And so um, that, is, that is currently ongoing, those discussions uh, with that particular business. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. That's all the questions I have. With that, I will go ahead and open up the uh, public hearing and uh, open up public comment. This is public comment for item B-1. Um, and Anthony, do we have um, any public comments, sir? Uh, Mayor, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. Okay. Um, Having no public comment, um, I will go ahead and close public comment, close the public hearing, and bring it back to council for, um, I'll entertain a motion if you are so inclined. Can we uh, comment uh, here first? Yes, absolutely, yeah, co comment or motion, what, whichever you'd like, absolutely. Okay, I, I just like to make a comment, I mean, obviously, putting water to the ground and pulling it back out and treating it so it can be used as drinking water is a, is a big deal and has to be handled properly. And I think uh, modifying our municipal code to comply with these requirements is absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, frankly, I'm not quite comfortable with the budget amounts because I don't really understand the scope of the work. And uh, I'm wondering if that can perhaps be uh, uh, bid out to different proposers or, or we need to look at that. But I think we definitely need to modify the municipal code and uh, I support the agenda item on that basis. Thank you, Council Member Heller. Did you want to make a motion to that effect? I will make a motion for approval, item okay. uh, B1. Great. Okay. I'll second. Okay, a motion uh, by Council Member Heller for um, uh, introducing the first reading by number and title only with further reading waived of ordinance number 642, restating and amending chapter 13.12 of the Morro Bay Muni Code to update and expand the city's sewer regulations. Second by, I think I heard council member Addis got in the wire. Um, and with that, um, any further comments or discussion? I would just uh, agree with Council Member Heller. I appreciate that comment with regard to cost. Um, I'm interested in obviously getting um, uh, future reports about the impact, especially on the two businesses uh, that will be most significantly impacted by this um, so that we're aware of those impacts and also potentially um, any impacts on smaller businesses 
uh, such as restaurants, etc., uh, just to get a, a further understanding of the fees. And I know those fees will be coming back to us. So with that, if there are no other comments, uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Member Heller? Yes. Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Great. Thank you for that. That concludes item B-1. That moves us to uh, item C, um, our business items. First is item C-1, um, City Council Goals and Objectives Update and Proposed Delay to the 2021-2022 Goal Setting Process. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Collins, please. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Council members, I'm going to share my screen. So one second. Let's see if this works. Can you see my uh, PowerPoint, Mayor? You bet. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, well, thank you. Um, wanted to give a brief update on the progress that uh, the city has made towards achieving the, the goals and action items for uh, calendar year 2019 and 2020. And, um, and briefly talk about what that process looks like and, and how we got to where we are. And then also talk about um, you know, staff's recommendation to delay initiation for the next two year cycle um, due to COVID-19 issues. So there you go, the agenda. Um, as council probably recalls, or at least most of you recall, uh, in 2019, early in the year, um, following the election, uh, we embarked on a community outreach effort uh, to get community input about uh, the existing goals, if we were missing anything with those goals and, and how we might achieve those using a new tool that we've we've had a couple of years of experience with POCO, um, as well as more traditional uh, uh, engagement efforts like a community forum and the like. And I uh, got a lot of participation over uh, over a couple hundred folks uh, were able to, to um, elicit their opinion or provide their opinion and the city council took that into consideration and did modify um, a couple of the goals, um, particularly around affordable housing. So as it stands now, uh, council has made achieving economic and fiscal sustainability the number one goal. Um, and we have improving infrastructure, public spaces, completing our land use plans for the future, as well as addressing affordable housing and then improving communication and community engagement were the, the four goals established for 19 and 20. Um, and there were approximately 26 action items related to those. Um, those are, are the initiatives that council wanted us to embark upon to help achieve those goals. And we've been providing as the best we can uh, quarterly updates to council on, on what we're doing on those specific action items. So I'm briefly gonna talk about it and it's in the report and the attachment. Um, but go through the where we're at with those 26 items. Uh, we've completed um, approximately eight of those, including the enhancement review of revenues, which led to, to Measure E, which was successfully passed, um, and, and trying to extend our efforts in economic development. Um, council requested that we uh, elicit um, services from the chamber to, to serve as our ombudsman for economic development. We're in our second fiscal year of that service uh, with the chamber and they're doing a great job. Uh, council asked for us to revise our short-term vacation rental policy. We completed that after a lengthy uh, community committee process, planning, planning commission and TBID review and ultimately approval by council. That's now on its way to Coastal Commission. Um, we added the short-term vacation rentals into the Tourism Business Improvement District. Uh, we re revised the partnership policy that helps uh, partner with uh, nonprofit organizations to carry out functions the city, -wise, uh, city otherwise wouldn't be able to do on its own or they can do it more efficiently. We reviewed our CalPERS uh, liabilities last year and made additional reforms to our approach to CalPERS. Uh, we consider, council considered local labor for uh, components of the wharf and that included language in the pipeline component of the project and uh, assuming we would do the same for the um, injection well component of the construction and added adult use to the cannabis um, for retail in our city. So those are the eight that are completed. Uh, the next slide is the action items where we've made significant progress, but not quite done. Uh, the first is a fee study. We've looked at 
virtually all of our fees, and council's taken action on, on almost 90% of those. We still have the impact fees to bring forward, which was discussed earlier in consent. Um, council adopted new waterfront lease policies, and the next stage of that is implementation. And staff, um, though we've been we've been hampered by COVID-19 and and just you know filling holes where we're able just to, to maintain existing services, but are trying to figure out a way to best uh, analyze different options for how to provide um, lease management services moving forward. We know that was a big topic of discussion during the Harbor Advisory Board. Um, opening discussion this earlier this afternoon. Um, planning staff and consultants are working very hard to complete the general plan, local coastal plan, plan update. It's gone through the planning commission. The IR is slated for review. Um, then it would move on to city council this early this year or in spring, and then on to coastal commission. Then the zoning code will begin that process after it's moved through the various bodies. Uh, Warfront implementation was a, was a standalone goal at one point, and now it's just rolled into public infrastructure. Um, we have acquired or secured a WIFIA line of credit for $62 million. Wharf site is under construction, pipeline contracts awarded. So cities in the process of completing the SRF loan processing, and there's a lot of other um, efforts underway regarding implementation of the Wharf. And we're on timeline to meet our time schedule order by the state. Um, for 2023. Uh, we've embarked on, and planning has embarked on efforts with uh, Slow County and other cities to combine efforts around the housing element and implementation of the housing element, seeking grants to work together to, to help address what, what is probably our biggest issue outside of COVID. Um, Council wanted us to implement one water CIP projects. Three projects are under design, and I don't know exactly where we are, but I think we're getting closer to a 30 print percent design on those uh, three projects. Uh, council approved us moving forward, um, taking the great work of the chamber on uh, stakeholder uh, input on our permitting process. And now we're in, in the early stages of reviewing our process internally and working with an ad hoc uh, group, which we're, we're hoping to launch later this month. And the parking management plan, uh, we have a consultant on board who did to uh, data inputs or data collection exercises once in the summer, once in the off season, and hopefully we'll be able to present the next round of, of data analysis and recommendations to council um, in a couple months, we're hoping. And then we have several items that are either just strictly kind of an ongoing thing or just um, haven't had time to get around to or not a lot of development around. Market Street Plaza development is, is still a question mark and it's a challenge right now with um, there's not a lot of lending going on for hotel development um, with, with the tourism industry being impacted by COVID. Offshore wind farm development will probably pick up the pace with the new administration at the, the federal level. High speed internet, we haven't had an opportunity to really go into depth on that, mainly from a staff capacity and financial issues. And then um, Chamber has been helping as well as uh, reach the, the Slow County and Santa Barbara kind of economic group um, to, to, to bring potential investments into our community, but no, no major information presented this time. Um, the winter shelter idea is, hasn't gained much ground. Um, I think the county is looking to fund more, more um, permanent solutions to, to, to homelessness. Um, and we're in discussions with Los Osos about some different options, but nothing concrete at this time to report. Uh, co-working space, much like the high-speed internet, just haven't had time to get around to that. Um, the grant uh, for boatyard feasibility study, not much work has been done on that. I will continue to coordinate with nonprofit groups um, now that we have a new um, uh, partnership policy in place. So that's where we're at with those 26 action items. Uh, and we also have these set of items that have come forward through future agenda um, direction from the council to review safe and sane fireworks ordinances, look at our city noise ordinance, review requirements for Senate Bill 1383. That's related to, to waste management um, and enforcement. Review city events policy, review city council compensation and local campaign contribution limits, provide a report on the city's process to determine 
uh, whether we need to implement four-way stops in certain areas. Um, we need to provide a report on the city's street sweeping performance and options, and then consider firearm safety regulation options as well. So that is, is sort of the, a quick update and happy to answer any questions if you have anything on that. Um, but as far as the next two year process is concerned, you know, typically we'd be embarking on an outreach program in January and February, um, and then host a community forum or a series of forums in March. And then the last uh, step is city council reviewing and adopting the goals or affirming the existing goals and, and action items in April so that we, we ha kind of can connect those to the next budget process. Um, however, given the significant impacts of COVID-19, uh, the fact that staff is spending an exorbitant amount of time uh, in addressing a once in a lifetime um, pandemic and public health emergency, uh, we simply haven't had don't have the resources either from a staff side or budget side to think about the next round of initiatives when we're, we're struggling to keep up with what we already have in place. So we would recommend delaying that uh, tentatively till, till May. Of course, if COVID conditions worsen, we may have to look at pushing that out a bit further, but we're hopeful with the vaccinations and, and, and the like that May would be a good time to start thinking about the future. Um, and so I just wanted to, to put that out there to staff. Um, you know, we, we certainly don't like being the one to say no, but we think this is prudent given that most of our resources are being applied to the most important um, community issue at, at this present time, which is, um, you know, keeping the public informed, keeping the public safe and, and preparing um, for a return to, new, uh, to our normal uh, through vaccinations and other efforts to combat COVID-19. So uh, again, we would recommend delaying the goal setting process until May, and tentatively, of course, if conditions worsen. Uh, we also are seeking direction to bring back um, to council the next council meeting, the, the budget and council meeting dates uh, to correspond with this delay um, if, if council is, is so inclined. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great, Scott, thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation summary and the comprehensive uh, review of uh, goals progress and uh, staff report. We do appreciate that very much, um, very thoughtful. And with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions and ask if uh, council member Addis, if you have questions. Start I don't you. have questions. Yeah, I don't have so many questions. Thank you to staff. I feel like we've made a ton of progress and uh, to my colleagues on council who have helped us move many of these things forward as well. I do have uh, comments and suggestions. Okay, I'm gonna get to that of, piece. We'll take those. I'm gonna go through questions first and then we'll hit the comments. Um, great, council member Davis, questions? Yes. Scott, um, do we not have de facto goals related to COVID recovery that we are pursuing as as a city? Uh, yes, sir. We, I mean, uh, we haven't called them as such, but yeah, we we have a, um, mm -hmm. the best platform or framework I can think of is the that you know, our, we're under uh, emergency and we have our emergency operations center going and have had it going since March. We create um, an IAP, which is just an action item or action uh, plan uh, to address the myriad of issues, uh, which sort of fall into several buckets, you know, public information, the public health piece, um, you know, assisting our business community. There may be some other categories, but yeah, we that's our template to ensure that we're reflecting back on what's really important to our community. And we refine those every couple of weeks and really appreciate the, the work of Chief Knuckles and uh, Chief Cox is helping to lead that up with him. And every, every pretty much the entire city staff have been working it in some capacity. Okay, I, I guess I just hate to present the appearance that we're just kind of dealing with things on a day-to-day -day as they come up. And I wonder if it wouldn't make sense to define and codify 
the goals that we are pursuing on a daily basis um, as city goals in some sort of a process. Yeah, I definitely could um, could pull that together. It it makes sense. Like I said, we we have we have those already written out as part of our our, our biweekly or bi monthly um, update for the emergency operations center. And so, I mean, it is what we're doing. So it, it's it is a reflection of where your staff is spending time. So it would it wouldn't be that hard to pull that together and potentially make sure we're not missing anything by asking our community for input. Okay, that, that's all the questions I have. Thank you very much for what you and your staff have heroically accomplished during this past year. Appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Davis. Council Member Heller, sir, do you have questions? I do, thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I want to acknowledge that I figured out how to do the race hand function. On the <laughs> so, you know, not that anyone will recognize it, but I'm just proud of myself, so a little self-acknowledgement. Uh, one step at a time. Um, so if the council wanted to, is there any reason we couldn't postpone goal setting for another year or perhaps two years? And let me tell you why I asked that. I really like our four goals. And when you see the list that Scott has presented, it's quite phenomenal what we've accomplished. Uh, I think staff and council and the community and the advisory committees but we still have some things to do under these four goals. And I look at those things to do and I say, there's a couple of years of work right there. And when you look at how much time we have to do perhaps more important things than goal setting processes, which frankly, when we ask the community, we get the same thing back year after year after year. I think we've got, the, we've got a great structure with these four goals, if I may say so, and I think we should postpone goal setting for two years. There's my question morphed into a comment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, it's a great, great question, Councilor Morreller, and yeah, absolutely, it's, uh, it's a policy, you know, the framework is developed by council, it's set in a resolution, but, um, you know, certainly a, uh, could be amended to delay for a couple of years or a year or whatever, uh, whatever is the pleasure of the, the council and certainly understand what you're saying. There is a lot of work left to do. And I think usually we sort of view this as a, a two year and a four year window. The two year is, is sort of the check in to make sure you know, the action items are, are making progress. Is there anything that sort of flaring up in different areas we want to address? And then the four year following a presidential is sort of looking at the goals. Are we missing, are we completely missing the mark or has things changed so much that we have to shift goal and gears? And I think COVID is sort of doing that on its own, right? So, and we, we have as an organization led by city council and, and staff following is, is that we, we need to shift and we have done that. Okay, thank you, Scott. Those are my thank questions. You, really, you bet, thank you. And council member Barton, please, questions. Um, I, more of a comment. Um, I, I'm thinking that the, the goals, as they are stated here, the four goals, almost anything that we would come up with would, would fit under, under those. So I, I'm um, agreeing with, with Jeff that there's, there may be um, the possibility of perhaps um, pulling back for a year. There's just so much going on. This is a really impressive list and um, statement of the, the the state of these different goals. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed. This is a small city and we have a small staff. This is, this is pretty amazing. So it's good to see. Great, thank you. Um, and I have no questions. So um, then we'll just go ahead and take us to a discussion or comments or recommendation. Um, Council member Annis, you wanna start us off? Uh, I'm sorry, Mayor, do you want to do public comment? Oh, yes, I should do public comment, huh? It's been such a long time since we've had a meeting. I apologize for that. So let me go ahead and open up public comment. This is agenda item C-1. Um, any of the member, any member of the public wishing to comment on this item, uh, please do so now. Anthony? Uh, Mayor, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. Okay. Wait a second. Seeing no hands raised, no public comment, I will close public comment. 
and go ahead and bring it back. And uh, Council Member Addis, you want to start us off with discussion? Yeah, I mean, I want to recognize how much staff is doing and how much um, council has done and the movement that we have made. But I also think um, it's important to think about the letter that the chamber sent and what the goals process is and the importance of community input. And I'm uncomfortable with the idea that uh, council would suspend the goals. And I'm wondering if we can find a middle ground of doing an interim goal, which would really focus on COVID recovery and allow us to gather more public input to make sure that we're aware of all of the needs in our community. I think under COVID recovery, we could just make it very simple, focused on two areas, economic recovery, as well as uh, public health. There was a large discussion at the beginning of this meeting about public health, about possible vaccination programs, about pods. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. And we did get some community input from residents back toward the beginning of COVID. The chamber has done a lot to get uh, input from the business community, but I think it's important that we continue to reach out and get that kind of input. And I also think it's important that um, to Council Member Davis's point, we don't appear that we just are not doing anything with our goals. Other cities are you know, going through the COVID crisis and they are updating and going through their goals process. Um, and I think we're working really hard and the goals process can demonstrate that but also allow our community to give more input on what's needed during COVID. And so that I would propose that we do an interim goal and come back, you know, do an interim goal around COVID recovery, gather public input through Polco, even if it's using the last Polco survey as a baseline and redoing similar questions, possibly a, you know, one meeting. Um, and then come back in May and check in to see, are we ready for the robust process or do we need to stick with this, you know, a COVID recovery? I think I would all, I just also want to add that, um, you know, the situation with COVID has changed and changed again and changed again. Um, and where we're at now is very different for people. And if there's not some rent relief and mortgage relief, uh, at the state level, we're going to have a very different situation again. And it's important that we continue to get that input to know what our businesses and our residents need. Great. Thank you for those comments. I appreciate that. Um, Council Member Davis, comments? I just want to echo and endorse Council Member Addis's comments. I think that uh, it is brilliant for us to embrace the efforts that we are making to deal with COVID on a daily basis and also to plan our economic recovery as we move forward away from the pandemic. Great, thank you, appreciate that. Um, Council Member Heller, comments? Uh, yeah, so my comments, with all due respect to, to what's been said, we are in a very stressed situation. In my mind, it's very clear what 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 the goals are for this city, for our businesses. Uh, it's a small town. We know what people want. We know what businesses need and what they want. And I'm I'm resistant to spending a lot of time setting goals and having meetings and getting community input, which is all well and good. When I think most of us know, if we had to say right now what this city needs economically and from a health standpoint, we would all pretty much come up with the same answers. So, I, I, I mean, I, I really think that we could add some action items under the existing structure of the four goals that we have in place already. I'm just trying to reduce the amount of time that we put in, uh, in with the process when it seems to me there are far more important things that need to get done today uh, that we know about with respect to COVID and economic recovery, so. Great, thank you, appreciate those comments. Um, Council Member Barton, please, comments? 
Oh, I, um, having listened to this further discussion, I, I would agree that there needs to to, um, uh, to be a focus on, on COVID recovery and maybe the specifics of that to, to um, help us stay focused, um, even though every day is a, you know, a new day with COVID and the, that we um, are constantly thinking about it. It's, it would not be a bad thing, I don't think, to add a, a goal that has to do with the recovery recovery and then and be able to um, kind of track it like these are the significant progress has been made, you know, dot, dot, dot. So that's, um, I, I would agree with, with the conversation. <clears throat> Got it. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, my comments are, um, uh, and first, let me acknowledge the uh, the chamber input. I, I do appreciate that um, and the intent of that. Uh, in terms of um, potentially new revenues being available and um, a new council and continuing on with adjusting and, and setting goals uh, for the future. Um, I'll make several comments uh, being, as most of you are internally involved with staff almost on a daily basis myself. I, 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 from an inside out perspective, I will tell you right now that um, we are constrained with regard to interim resources, and I don't mean that negatively with regard to the individuals, but we have um, major challenges in the finance department, um, given the fact that we do not have um, a seated, uh, full-time recruited uh, finance director. Um, I believe Ms. Lichtig is doing a, an excellent job. However, um, I do know that um, there's a learning curve there um, for an individual that specifically is not uh, a focused finance person. And again, no disrespect whatsoever, uh, but that, that leaves us constrained with regard to the ability to do, I think, significant financial planning. In public works, we, we've had, we're having staffing changes occur on a major project um, with regard to our lead and the lack of a lead individual um, in the public works department. That concerns me significantly. We're about to embark on a major planning process review that is going to be very significant that was um, um, suggested by the council and will, I think, take a significant amount of staff time um, to, to move that initiative forward. And so um, I do see constraints internally with regard to resources to, to go through a full-blown planning process. My comments up front, and I think I, I heard concurrence across the board, um, this pandemic is going to get worse. And, and I, I can tell you, um, I mean, you can quote me, um, it, it is going to get worse. And, and, and prime goal number one, as I heard stated, and I absolutely agree with is, what do we need to do to protect our public and maximize the response to the pandemic? It's not gonna happen at the state level. It's not gonna happen at the county level for us. And we're gonna need to allocate resources to make this thing happen and to get our population ready and immunized in order to get businesses back to work in order to protect people long-term and to continue to message people with regard to that. So I'm very supportive of a refocused goal, as I think was stated, on what we need to do from a resource standpoint. It will cost probably money uh, from the city in order to make this happen, that um, otherwise we're going to be at the mercy of the county and or the state, and um, that the good, as good a job as I think they do, um, they can't do it as well as I believe we can internally with their assistance. And, and that is, is a major area of focus. The third thing is in the midst of a pandemic, um, I, I want to engage the public, but it will not be as robust as it has been in the past. And I'm concerned about that. I wouldn't mind beginning a process of a Polco input um, with regard to um, trying to ascertain what the public would like us to do. I, I do agree with Council Member Heller. Um, we we kind of know because we've done some recent polling, but um, it's not gonna be robust like it has been when we have community meetings where we get a large number of people showing up that give us um, significant input. So I'm, I'm 
concerned about embarking fully on the planning process with uh, the lack of a robust uh, public comment, public engagement process, but would very much support um, the beginning of some online, um, you know, um, processes to determine what the needs are. From a, from a, a budget standpoint, um, we are uh, entering into labor negotiations, which again will con uh, constrain staff time significantly from all three bargaining units, um, again, limiting our resources available for, for a major planning initiative. And, and lastly, for me, um, when I look at the comment about um, Measure E20, and the availability of revenues, remember that we have um, significantly depleted our reserves. And I believe we will have discussions significantly about um, the availability of new funds and the need to get that cushion back should there be a third surge of this pandemic or ongoing financial issues, should there not be um, state or federal aid, which we have yet to see, with regard to reimbursement to cities, and that concerns me greatly. So to, to go through a robust process of determining new allocations for spending um, without replenishing our reserves really concerns me. So for all of that, I think I'm landing um, with um, the majority of you in, in suggesting that staff, perhaps we could do a, a, a beginning outreach through either Polco or or what have you to get community input. Um, and then perhaps as we, we get further resources um, in key positions like finance, public works, move our planning process forward, et cetera, um, we might be in a better position to really uh, significantly examine goals. And the last thing I will say is not this quarter, but I believe the next fiscal quarter is going to be disastrous for the city worse than the March, uh, excuse me, the uh, March, April, May, June time period, which isn't a quarter, but it would be the um, April, May, June time period when the pandemic first hit. We had a significant recovery um, in July, August, and September. Um, as of now, um, September, October, November uh, will probably look good, but Thereafter, it's going to be worse, in my opinion, than it was in the beginning of the pandemic. And so um, I'm very concerned about finances going forward and, and being able to um, appropriately um, manage a new budget. So that's a lot of stuff. But all that said, internally, I think what I hear is alignment to move um, um, a process forward for doing as much uh, community input through either Polco or what have you to begin that process, but also to uh, redefine the goal around the pandemic and the pandemic response to protect public health and what allocate, what resources might be necessary to allocate to make that happen. And um, I, see, I see heads nodding, I think, uh, across the board. Is that? I would just uh, add uh, public health and economic recovery. And economic recovery, yes, yes. And we've centered on those on those two big uh, broad buckets. And I do think to uh, Council Member Barton and Heller's points, I do think a lot of what's already in the goals uh, aligns well with economic recovery and public health. To be honest, when we think about housing, I think of housing as a public health. Uh, what will become a public health crisis if there's not rent and mortgage relief? Um, Housing is going to grow to be a public health crisis even more than it is in Morro Bay. I agree. I agree. Uh, so I'm kind of hearing, um, and I'm, I'm moving towards uh, maybe a general um, recommendation uh, that we um, begin the process of, uh, I'll make this a motion, um, begin the process of obtaining um, input through Polco, um, et cetera, on potential future community goals. Um, and then secondarily, that we add a major initiative that focuses on public health response locally to the pandemic and resource allocation necessary for that, and then continue on with our existing goals, perhaps come back and, well, the, the issue of um, 
the preparedness for COVID-19, I think, needs to come back within 30 days. Um, we, we need to get moving. And so I would, would add that to my motion that we come back with, with that a recommendation in 30 days and that staff come back and report on a community engagement process that they think appropriate um, right now during the pandemic. Does that make sense or did I ramble that too much for you guys? Ask that chance, but I would like to ask for a friendly amendment. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, if you would consider adding and economic recovery as well as a, um, a timeline of touching in in May uh, to see if we're ready for a more robust goals pro process. I think the timeline put forward was to push the goals to May so that we make sure to check in then. Um, I would uh, uh, absolutely support that friendly amendment. And, and so I'll second. Uh, okay, so there is a motion on, on the, t uh, the uh, table uh, by Mayor Heading, um, as stated, seconded by Council Member um, Addis with the friendly amendment or addendum. Um, and I'll ask if that's clear or there's further uh, communication or discussion. And also include staff. Are you clear on the, the recommendation? If I may, uh, I think easier if we just focus the uh, outreach now on COVID and then um, in May, if, if we're at the appropriate place, then to talk about future. Maybe con confusing if we're doing both at the same time. That would be my only uh, concern. But I think I understand the rest of it. Just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Other comments? Uh, yeah, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Sure. No, I think, I think we are whether we make it a goal or not, completely focused on COVID, the financial impacts and the health impacts. Do we need to make this a goal? Um, I mean, that's what we're doing. If it, it's gonna help us to make it a goal and get more input from the community, great. But I, I just don't, I mean, that's what we're doing. And maybe we should just state it and say everything else falls behind this. But I'm just not sure what the purpose of that is, to be frank. Um, so, yeah, let me be clear, and, and I apologize that I wasn't um, as clear as I should have been. The goal specifically would be um, a, a, a within 30 days, come back with um, a plan to protect public health that would, would involve the things that I outlined initially, not only a communication plan, but um, a localized plan for immunization of our own community and uh, basically the costs associated with that. I believe the key to getting out of this pandemic is vaccination of as much of our population as possible. And um, that's the piece, Councilmember Hiller, that in my mind is missing. It's just that piece only, really. Uh, we're doing everything else. You're absolutely correct. Um, I believe we have a framework established by our fire chief for readiness, but there need to be resources allocated, either voluntary or staff, to make this happen. And we need to get organized to be able to administer the vaccines when they come, rather than wait for the county and or state to make it happen. Okay, yeah. The other part, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and the other part was just beginning a process through online poll call um, questions to be used later um, in a ro more robust um, goal setting process. But but to begin just asking the community about priorities as we have in the past. Okay, well, I appreciate your comments about vaccination and making that a front burner item, which I agree with 100% and a poll call. Uh, exercise for for other uh, comment from the community seems seems to make sense to me. So thank you for that clarification. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm good with the uh, friendly amendment. Okay. Um, Wait, other, would you be open to another friendly amendment? It depends how friendly it is. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm I'm just I'm wondering if if we can hone this in. Um, so it's just an interim goal focused on COVID, that the outreach would be focused on COVID, uh, both you know the health aspect and the economic recovery aspect. Keep that you know uh, as an interim goal with a touch point in May to see if we're ready to do that robust process. Because if we ask folks now about what they want in the future, I just don't know what that future looks like. Um, I'd, I'd rather ask them in the future 
you know, when, when we're at that point, what they want, if that makes sense. I, I, they keep I, like, uh, I like that friendly amendment to your own friendly amendment. <laughs> so, so the amendment of the amendment is acceptable to the motion maker, and um, I would revise my motion to, um, well, I'll withdraw my motion and restate it. How's that? Would you allow that to be withdrawn? Okay. And, and Mr. Yeah. Collins, I want to be clear again, your comment about, I wanted to capture that as well. Yes, sir. I think the the friendly does, and and, and makes friendly. perfect sense to uh, to uh, thirty days. We'll we'll come back with um, the the goals and uh, input from the community. So I'll move that um, we delay the major goal setting review process as recommended by staff. Number one, number two, that we come that we ask staff to come back in thirty days with a focused. Um, um, goal to protect public health and um, address the COVID-19 issue. And that third, we, we engage the community in obtaining feedback with regard to that specific issue and postpone any other um, goal setting activities until a later date. Does that capture it, Don? Public health and economic recovery you cannot, related to COVID. Keep forgetting to say that, yes. Second. Okay. <laughs> so we have a motion by myself, uh, as stated, second by Councilmember Heller, with head nods by Councilmember um, Addis. Uh, any further discussion? Scott, are you good with that? No, but I, I just, yeah, and thank you to staff for uh, being willing to do this. I know it's a heavy load, but I think our community. Um, I do think our community deserves to have some kind of process and input, and I think this is a good, this is a good step. And I don't know if we need it in the in the in the motion that will come back in May, or if, if we can just understand that timeline. Yeah, and I'm understanding that. Is that well, what we do is. Um yeah, thank you, Mary. Yeah, all understood. I think what we'll do is we got to bring back the budget uh, and ca uh, council meeting calendar next council meeting. We'll probably just put in tentative dates for restarting the outreach. But of course, that'll all be tentative based on COVID conditions. So. And I want to recognize Councilmember Barton's comments about we got a lot going on, and for a small city, um, it's already. Um, a, a full plate or a very large plate of very important issues that we continue to work on. And so, so noted. And thank you, Councilmember Barton, for bringing that up. With that, if there's no further discussion, um, I'll call, ask for a roll call vote, please. Mayor Henning? Yes. Councilmember Heller? Yes. Member Addis? Yes. Councilmember Barton? Yes. And Councilmember Davis? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you for that great discussion. And um, that brings us to uh, business item C-2, consideration of proposal and approval of contract with Cogstone Resource Management Incorporated for archeological and paleontological, well, paleontological monitoring services for the water reclamation facility lift stations and offset pipelines construction. And I will turn it over to Mr. Leivik and I believe Mr. Casares. Great. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to take one second. We had a number of questions um, on um, the item, item B and I wanted to direct everybody. I was having some technical difficulties uh, to the enhanced source control program that was attached to that item appendix F will give a very, very detailed breakdown of the costs associated with the first year of operation and subsequent years. So I just wanted to get that out there. Uh, it is something that is linked to that item and wasn't attached, has to be downloaded from the city's website because it's a, a large document. So I uh, just wanted to, to throw that out there because I was having problems with my computer during that item. Thank you for that clarification, Eric. Thank you. Um, so thank you again for having me here to, uh, to present again. Um, we don't have a presentation um, on this item or, or the next item, um, but uh, staff recommends the city council receive, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong item. <laughs> More technical difficulties. I'm rusty as well. It's been a while since we've had a meeting. C2. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, so real quickly, staff recommends the city council uh, review the, um, the uh, attached staff report uh, and proposal uh, and review the recommendation from staff to award a contract to Cogstone for archeological and paleontological monitoring services uh, for the list station and offsite pipelines component of the WERF and recommend the city council authorize the city manager to execute an agreement in an amount not to exceed $264,918. Um, so I'll just walk through the staff report here quickly and then can answer any questions. Um, just at, at the top end, uh, this is something that we've always anticipated would need to be done for, um, uh, for this component of the project. Uh, we provided um, archaeological, uh, paleontological, and tribal monitoring services for uh, the construction of the water reclamation facility. Um, those services um, pretty much concluded as of last Friday, as we've um, nearly completed uh, all of the earthwork uh, at the water reclamation facility site, uh, and these services would cover uh, the construction of the pipelines uh, and the pump stations. Uh, our um, project uh, archaeologists for Western um, prepared a monitoring plan for the water reclamation facility, and they also prepared a uh, monitoring plan for the lift station, uh, lift stations, uh, or excuse me, the lift stations and the pipelines. Um, those monitoring plans, uh, per our agreement with the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, were reviewed uh, and approved, and they require uh, monitoring as discussed in the staff report. Um, the majority of the cost of this item is associated with the tribal monitoring. So um, kind of unlike the water reclamation facility where pretty much all of the um, earth disturbing activities um, were monitored by an archeologist and a tribal representative, our monitoring plan that's been uh, reviewed and approved um, has very minimal archeological monitoring and uh, much more tribal monitoring. So essentially the whole pipeline route and construction of the pump stations will be monitored um, by the tribal monitors. Uh, and the archaeologist will only be monitoring uh, select sites uh, based on um, investigations that we've done uh, in and around uh, the pipeline route um, previously in, in, 20, in 2020. Um, as is mentioned in the fiscal impact section, um, the contract value is 260, uh, roughly $265,000. Um, the last budget update that we brought to council um, back in, uh, would have been in November of 2020, um, reflected the time period through September 2020. Um, we had uh, $550,000 budgeted for the archeological uh, and Native American monitoring. So if you compare the 265,000 um, that we're asking council to approve tonight uh, to the 550,000, we've got um, uh, some uh, some allowance there in that budget item <clears throat> as it currently sits in, in the budget. And that's not just for um, a fiscal year, uh, that is for the duration of the project. So we asked the proposers to assume um, a duration of the project and assume a number of hours for um, the tribal monitors and other activities. Um, and, and that is based on, that 265,000 is, is based on our assumption for um, the entire project. Um, this, uh, this, what we're asking you to approve tonight is the culmination of a process that started back on October 8th. Um, the city released in RFP RQ um, for these services. Uh, we received uh, a total of, um, of four proposals and um, we are asking um, the city to approve um, uh, the, the contract with Cogstone um, based on our, uh, our evaluation uh, of those proposals. Um, the proposals were due on um, on October, ooh, it says 20th, it should be October 30th, 2020. Um, we received, again, we received four proposals from Cogstone E-Corp, um, Albion, and Paleo West. Um, we evaluated those uh, proposals based on a number of criteria, um, understanding of the scope of work, past performance, uh, and related experience of the firm, expertise of the uh, technical team members, um, their approach to the project, recent experience, uh, cost effectiveness of their proposal, uh, and ability to conform to the contract requirements that the city has in their standard contract. Um, the proposals were reviewed by myself, uh, Mr. Leibach, and, and Mr. Uh, Miller, 
um, and um, and Cogstone was selected based on on that review. Uh, just to note, um, Cogstone is currently working with the Felons Black and Beach team uh, for monitoring the work of the work site, um, performing a very similar um, function as they will be for this section of the uh, of the work. And again, they were contracted with. Um, with Felons Black and Beach, and that contract is uh, is ending. Um, in conclusion, uh, staff recommends award of the contract for archaeological and paleontological monitoring services for the lift station and offsite pipelines to Cogstone, uh, based on the solicitation process that we uh, discussed um, and has taken place since October of the previous year. Uh, and with that, I can entertain uh, any questions. Thank you, Eric. Very much appreciated. And thank you, Rob, for your participation um, in the staff report. Um, let me open it up for council questions. Uh, council Member Barton, do you have questions? Um, no, I don't have questions. I, I was pleased to see the depth of the proposal and um, interesting to see that it's a, a, a woman owned business. Um, it's, it's just an, another another process for this the uh, work. Um, I think it, it, it's good that that we have this process because, as they pointed out, this is an area full of previous occupation by different groups of people, and um, so it, it would be important to to know that and to to um, deal with anything that might get dug up. So um, anyway, I I was um, impressed with the quality of the proposal. Great, thank you for that, appreciate it. Council Member Heller, sir, questions? Yes, I have a question or two. Mm -hmm. And if, I, if I've if i asked any question that's been asked or discussed, I apologize, I did have a quick uh, biological break, <laughs> uh, which had to be taken care of. Good. Uh, <clears throat> so the paleontological monitoring service, that's basically tribal monitoring, is that what we're talking about there, Eric? There's really three separate elements. Um, there is um, the archaeologists were required um, by our work with the State Historic Preservation Office to have a, um, a registered archaeologist on the project. Uh, the paleontological is actually um, dinosaur uh, bones, oh. those kinds of things, fossils, I should say. Um, and um, then the third component of this is um, is the tribal monitoring. So. Um, Cogstone's approach is uh, they have monitors that are approved to serve both the archaeological and paleontological function. So rather than have two separate monitors for those activities, um, they're using a single monitor, again, which helps with um, the cost effectiveness. And then um, I should have mentioned in the discussion of the staff report um, that there are three tribes in the area that have expressed interest um, and we've been consulting with for a number of years um, to participate on this part of the project. So the direction that we decided to take is we directed all proposers, um, all archaeological firms that wanted to propose on this, um, that they had to um, subcontract with all three of the tribes that are interested in participating in this portion of the project. Uh, and then the archaeologist is responsible for coordinating the activities of the tribes. So all tribes will have the ability to participate on the project equally. Um, and there will only be one monitor at a time. So uh, one group may be monitoring for two weeks and then another group monitors for two weeks and then another group, and then it starts over. But that'll be at the, um, at the discretion of the archeologist, but they have been directed to keep that um, uh, equal I mean, among the three tribes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I've received some questions about cultural site CA dash slow dash 16, which I have no idea where that is, but you probably know where it is. Um, and and the, the question I got was that it appears to be excluded from the scope of the work of the contract that we're considering up for this item, but that it's addressed in the EIR addendum. Uh, are you familiar with that issue and uh, that site and, and uh, what the EIR addendum says about that site or why it's excluded or? Absolutely. I have more, I have more information if you want me to read it, but I, I don't know if you're. Yes, um, that, that's, a, that's a good segue. So um, that site, CA Slow uh, 16, um, was identified in the EIR, was identified in uh, the programmatic agreement with SHPO, 
and it is an area that we are going to be paying attention to. It's probably the most important archaeological area in the pipeline alignment. Um, we made the decision to exclude um, the monitoring, and that site we know is going to have mitigation. So there, um, part of the work that we've been doing over 2020 that was required by the programmatic agreement uh, was, again, our project archaeologist, Far Western, um, they went out and drilled um, small holes in the ground uh, and took borings to identify or clear different areas of the project. And they did borings in that area and identified that um, there were um, there were archaeological artifacts in that area. So we know we're going to have to do mitigation. Um, we made the decision in this RFP to exclude that area. Uh, and the intention is to um, is to negotiate and bring to council a recommendation to award a contract amendment to Far Western in order to do that mitigation work. So we're going to have Cockstone doing the monitoring and the tribal monitoring for essentially the entire alignment with the exception of that small section that we know um, is sensitive and we're going to have to do mitigation work. Um, we've known that there's money in, um, in the current uh, work budget to complete that mitigation work. And um, we decided based on Far Western's history um, and their work doing the investigations that uh, we would negotiate that work with them. Okay, thank you for that explanation. I appreciate it. That's my only question, Mr. Mayor. Thank, thank you, you. Councilmember Hiller, appreciate that. Uh, Councilmember Addis, questions? No questions at this time. Thank you. Councilmember Davis, sir, questions? No questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and open up public comment. This is public comment for item C-2 on the agenda. Uh, public comment is now open. And Anthony, any public comment? I do see a raised hand from Betty Wintholtz. Great, welcome Betty. Okay, Betty, you're live. Am I live? Yes. Okay, thank you. This is Betty Winholz. So I want to follow up on Mr. Heller's question about Site 16 and um, what kind of conflict or um, not conflict would there be between the two monitoring groups? It seems to me that that... Uh, I don't know. That that seems awkward that you would have two different companies working on um, the overall project and then this particular site in particular. And what is the timing for the reconciliation of this particular site and how does that timing fit into the overall plan? So I guess I'd like to know about the conflict and the timing of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anthony, further public comment? Uh, Mayor, I, I do not see any more raised hands in the queue. Okay, thank you for that. I'll go ahead and close public comment on item C2, bring it back to council. Um, Eric, did you want to address uh, Ms. Winholt's question about conflicts between the two monitoring groups and the timing issue she raised? Yeah, that's a, um, Ms. Winholt brings up a good question. Um, and so just to maybe separate those two a little bit. We're asking the firm um, that we want to award a contract here tonight to monitor um, the, um, the areas of the remaining areas of the pipeline. As I mentioned, based on our investigations, um, we, um, we don't think we have a high likelihood of finding artifacts um, throughout the duration for throughout the pipeline alignment. Um, and that's because of all the investigation work that we've previously done. So um, our fingers crossed the investigation work um, that we've done holds up and we don't encounter anything um, during construction of the remaining section of the pipeline. As I mentioned, we do know that there are, um, there are uh, known, um, there, there are known archeologically significant um, elements in that section that we're talking about. Um, and so, the, we're not really doing monitoring there, we're doing mitigation. So what's going to happen there is that the contractor is going to open up a section uh, where that mitigation needs to take place. Um, and the archeologist team is going to come in there. Um, so the archeologist, or excuse me, the uh, contractor will open up that section. Um, so do some excavation. They'll, they'll move on to another section of the project. 
um, continue to work on the other section of the project while the archaeologic uh, archaeologist team goes through there and clears that site. So one, it's two very different types of work, um, which is why we decided to um, to split that up. Uh, and then number two, as I mentioned, for the monitoring activities, we're going to have a single tribal monitor monitoring most um, most all of the activities um, on the remainder of the pipeline. In this single section, um, it is in Caltrans jurisdiction, um, and typically Caltrans will require all three interested groups or all interested groups to monitor at any given time. So it's a, I guess it's a very different it's a very different type of work, which is why we separated. Um, the two of those. And it was clearly delineated in the RFP that this is just for monitoring, not mitigation. Um, and we were going to be handling that um, uh, via a separate pathway. Thank you, Eric, for that um, explanation. One, one quick, the second part of that question, which is timing. Um, right. We are um, eagerly awaiting the baseline schedule from the contractor, which we hope to be getting tomorrow. Um, and so once we have um, that baseline schedule, we'll be able to um, we'll be able to schedule the, that mitigation work. So right now we have an overall duration for the pipeline project. Um, we've worked been working with the contractor for um, the better part of six weeks um, to get them up to speed, and they're going to be delivering their baseline schedule to us. Um, in the next couple of days, which will allow us to then schedule that mitigation work and put a lot more detail into our program schedule um, based on their baseline schedule. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate the comprehensive um, answer to that great question and those two questions. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and bring it back to council, um, either entertain a motion or any further discussion. I move for approval item C2. Motion by Council Member Hiller to approve C2. Second. Second by Council Member Barton. That would be for um, the uh, City Council to authorize City Manager to ex execute a contract not to exceed the amount of 264918. Any further discussion? If not, roll call vote, please. Council Member Hiller. Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Mayor Heading? Yes. Thank you for that. Again, thank you, Eric and Rob, for um, the report and your presentation, Eric. Appreciate that very much. That brings us to item C 3. This is consideration of proposal and approval of contract with Kevin Merck Associates, LLC for biological monitoring services for the water reclamation facility, lift stations, and off-site pipelines construction. And I, again, will turn it over, I assume, to Mr. Casares. Actually, Mr. Mayor, I think I'll, I'll take this one. Well, Rob, there you are. Thank you. Um, similar to the um, last item, um, this is monitoring that's necessary for the construction of the um, pipeline and uh, lift stations that will um, serve the new water reclamation facility. Um, and staff is recommending we award a contract to Kevin Merck and Associates for biological monitoring services um, and authorize the city manager to execute a contract not to exceed $71,310. Um, as far as financial impact, the um, the WORF budget includes an estimate of $100,000 for um, this portion of the project to for biological monitoring, um, and um, um, KMA's proposal um, of $71,000, $300,000 um, will not um, impact the overall budget or the rates um, paid by water and wastewater customers. Again, this. Um, RFP was released on um, excuse me October eighth, twenty twenty, um, and um, uh, provided some requirements for that proposal based on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife's biological opinion and our final EIR for the project. Um, we received um, a number of proposals, ten, um, including um, KMA's proposal. Um, from um, ranging from Altos and Mead, um, 
AES, JBD, S Corp, um, in them, um, Environmental Services, GPA Consulting, Rincon Consultants, SWCA, SWCA Consultants, and Padre Associates. Um, we've included um, KMA's proposal as an attachment to the report. Um, KMA was based on um, unanimously by um, the, the same review team as the previous project, myself, Mr. Caceres, and Mr. Miller. Um, uh, KMA has been the project biologist for a number of years and was instrumental in preparation of the final EIR, the EIR addendum, and negotiation of the biological opinion and biological um, monitoring and training for the WERF. Um, KMA is currently performing similar services um, on the WERF site. And um, with that, staff recommends the award of the contract of biological monitoring services um, for the conveyance system project to KMA based on this solicitation, the review process um, um, that took place in October 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate the presentation and the recommendation. Um, with that, I'll open it up for council questions. Council Member Davis, uh, any questions, sir? No, sir, I have no question. Okay, Council Member Addis, any questions, ma'am? I don't have any questions. Okay, and Council Member Heller, sir, any questions? Uh, yeah, Rob, I have a question. Um, is a stream bed alteration agreement required for the pipeline portion of the project? At um, uh, two locations, the crossing of Willow Camp Creek and um, the crossing of Morrow Creek will require a stream bed alteration agreement from California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We're in process um, on that permit, um, submitted it um, in fall of last year. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's been a backlog with um, um, all the resource agencies with having to work from home and getting these permits approved. But we expect um, um, to re be receiving that stream bed alteration agreement permit um, anytime now. So I don't know the sequence of the pipeline work, but is there any chance the delay in getting some of these permits might delay work on the pipeline that would end up uh, coming back to the city as change orders? Um, I don't believe so. We have not received the baseline schedule from Anvil Construction, but I don't believe they plan on starting with the pipe bridge. Um, that's a longer lead time item. They'll have to have that fabricated first before they can um, get in there and do that work. So um, we expect to have that permit well ahead of um, them needing to install the pipe bridge. I would expect that um, they're going to need to get started probably um, with mobilizing for the um, bore pits for the um, the crossing of the roundabout because that's a, a, a long um, horizontal directional drill or boring operation that they'll be needing to do there. Okay, thank you, Rob. Those are my questions. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Barton, questions? No questions. Great, and I have no questions, Rob, thank you. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and open up public comment. This is public comment for item C-3 on the agenda. And the public comment is now open. Um, Anthony, any public comments, sir? Yes, I have Betty Windholtz with her hand raised. Just a moment, I'll go ahead and unmute her. I'll be right back. Welcome, Betty. Okay, Betty, Hi, thank you're you. unmuted. Uh, am I? You're live. You are I am live. live. Okay, thank you. This is Betty Winholtz. Um, I want to talk about the Willow Camp Creek um, next to the list station next to Lemos. Um, have you asked to put fill into that creek? Uh, it is a wetland. It's a 100-year flood zone. Um, and will you also need a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permit to, for that area as well? That's my question. Thank you, Betty. Anthony, any uh, further public comment? Uh, no, Mayor. I do not see any raised hands. Okay. I will close public comment for item C3. Bring it back to council and ask Rob if you'll address uh, Ms. Winholtz's question about Willow Camp Creek um, requiring fill and also anything with regard to U.S. Army Corps. 
um, no fill in Willow Cramp Creek um, due to um, it is a wetlands area, and uh, we were looking to um, avoid a um, um, Army Corps permit there. So that will be a um, bore um, under the creek um, there to um, make sure that we don't impact those wetlands there. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, we don't have an Army Corps permit for um, that work there. Yeah, just one quick clarification. We don't have an Army Corps permit um, and no permit from the regional board, but our streambed alteration agreement with CDFW um, will will cover that crossing as well. So yes, it'll it'll include a, um, a frack out plan to make sure that the drilling mud um, doesn't um, get into the creek. Okay, thank you for addressing that. I appreciate it. With that, um, I'll bring it back. Uh, entertain a motion. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, move that the city authorize the city manager to execute an agreement in the not to exceed amount of $71,310 for the approval of the contract uh, with Kevin Merck and Associates for biological monitoring services for the WRF lift stations and offsite pipelines construction. Second. Second. I'll take him. Motion by Mayor Hetty for the staff recommendation. Second by, did I get Council Member Davis first? I think that was what I heard. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, um, roll call vote, please. Mayor Heading? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. And Council Member Heller? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, Rob, very much for the presentation and staff report. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you. Good to see you and Happy New Year. Uh, that brings us to item D, Council Declaration of Future Agenda Items. Do we have any? I see Councilmember Addis, your head shaking. <laughs> I have two. Uh, the first I mentioned earlier in the meeting, and I want to thank Council Member Heller for uh, his support in this discussion already, but I'd like to ask that uh, my colleagues agendize writing a letter supporting impeachment, and I think we could do that with a uh, very, very short timeline. It's The letter I'm proposing is about eight sentences long and would just say, that the Morro Bay City Council joins calls for President Donald Trump's immediate removal from office, either by invoking the 25th Amendment or by impeachment for inciting violence against the government of the United States. Donald Trump's bid to overturn the results of the free and fair election that he lost cannot be met with silence. Our democracy belongs to the people. It is imperative that we hold those who violently attacked our capital and who promoted such attacks responsible. We join other local, state, and federal leaders to support this effort for the sake of our democracy, the very democracy that provides us the privilege to serve. Um, and so I would ask if we could agendize that and hold a special meeting to um, get that, meet that letter signed as soon as Friday. Is there a general support for that, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Looking for I support it, uh, although it seems like more than eight sentences. <laughs> it feels like it, but and it doesn't have to be that letter, but that's the letter I have. Yeah, okay. I, I support it as well. Um, do we have to, uh, Mayor Heading, do we have to wait until Friday? I know we have a closed session meeting scheduled for tomorrow. I don't know the time frame. Can we declare an emergency and and uh, add this special meeting to that same time frame. Chris, let me uh, have you weigh in. Is this something that per policy, um, the mayor could write basically now, or um, do we need to agendize this for a special meeting? I believe pursuant to uh, Morro Bay's policies, uh, if the mayor is gonna sign a letter saying the council uh, believes X, Y, or Z, regardless of the gravity of the situation, um, the council needs to vote on it and take public comment on whether or not that letter should or should not be sent. 
Uh, there's a 24 hour requirement for noticing a special meeting. So unfortunately it's too late to notice a special meeting for tomorrow. Okay, so um, we do have support for that. Um, and we do have support for agendizing it um, rapidly. Um, so I'll uh, work with um, uh, staff and Chris to get this agendized in a special meeting. Um, wouldn't be tomorrow, perhaps the following day. Okay. All right. I could make Thursday work. I can also make Friday work. Well, we will poll you folks and make it uh, such that we also can include the public as well. Very good. Thank you. And uh, any other future agenda items? The other one, I had one other that I was uh, hoping council would support. I noticed during this process of um, board interviews, and I noticed this last year too, that it's very hard to recruit. And then we had a number of people drop out of the process. Um, and I received two different emails from community members making suggestions about the process. Um, not so much from a policy perspective, but how we enact the policy. And so I was hoping we could create a subcommittee um, to take a look at what we could do better so that not only do we get more applicants, but that the applicants don't drop out uh, before we've even had a chance to vote. I was very concerned with the number of applicants dropped out and it made me uh, think that we could improve our actions and the way that um, we carry out our policy. And so asking, I think to create a subcommittee, we would need to have this as a future agenda item Correct. so that we could vote to create a subcommittee. Correct, we would have to agendize that and um, I would support it and be happy to work with you. Well, we'll let council decide that obviously, but, <laughs> but I would support uh, agendizing the item if, um, I'd love it. to have you work with me, Mr. Mayor, if council would like the two of us to work on this. I'd yeah, be happy would, to do the work on this. That would occur at the time we agendized it, um, and, and so that would be the time. But is that, do I have general support for that? Um, uh, I have a comment, if I could. I'm, while I support, I, I support the, you, what you said exactly, council member Tadis, but uh, given what we said earlier in the meeting about what's really on the front burner, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to oppose agendizing it at this time. Yeah, and, I, and, and from a priority standpoint, it may not come very quickly. Um, so, uh, and I can tell you, we have some other pressing items that would come ahead of it, but um, if there is general support, we'll add it to the list and, and bring it back at an appropriate time. So. Looks like we have two. And I do think, um, just to clarify, I'm not asking staff to do any work. I'm asking council to appoint a subcommittee so that a couple council members could start to dig into, you know, what do other cities do? How do people get uh, people to apply and go through the full interview process? How could we improve our recruitment? Um, what are, you know, but, but the first step is really for a couple council members on a subcommittee to start uh, finding out what's out there and how we could do this better and then come back at some, you know, later date to talk about. And I don't even know if that would require staff to do much. Um, we just don't know unless we have a couple people that can look into it. So I have two, two council members I'm looking at. Is there a third council member? I support that. Okay, so we do have uh, majority support for that. Thank you, Council Member, for your concern. Council Member Heller, for your concern, I share it. And I will make sure, since we have agreement, that it does get prioritized, uh, not ahead of things that um, obviously we talked about this evening, like COVID-19 response, et cetera, et cetera. So um, um, you have my word on that. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. We have a lot on the agenda. I will take any burning desires. If there are any other, um, if not, okay, great. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, Happy New Year to everybody. Um, that adjourns this meeting. The next regular meeting of the Moore Bay City Council will be held on Tuesday, January 26th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. via teleconference. Be safe and be well. Thank you and good evening. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.